Welcome back. We are now moving on to archaeology and documentary. As you will remember, documentaries are another popular form of archaeological cinema. While Indiana Jones may have interested a generation or two of Americans in archaeology, the UK equivalent would be Time Team, of course. From the assigned reading this week, Carol Kulik's extensive examination of archaeology and British television illuminates the trends within this form of documentary. Kulik reviews the years between 1998 and 2002, during which time broadcasting of archaeological documentaries increased threefold, with over 650 transmissions in five years. Kulik analyzed 590 of these. Of note, television is identified as the number one source of archaeological information for the public for those who don't, do not visit museums or open excavations. She also found that this subject was generally not sensationalized and was reasonably broad and accurate. She found that the majority of the programs covered 500 BC to 8400, the good old Romans. This was followed by 400 to 1300, which maps neatly into the medieval period. Mixed periods next, followed by the Paleolithic and the Neolithic. Note that her choice of time periods is important. She acknowledges in the article that had she combined the three more modern eras in one, it would have produced a different outcome. Equally interesting are the topics that the programs covered. You'll note that bodies received top ranking with settlements and experimental archaeology next. Kulik notes that if you add mummies to bodies, that rises to 18% of all programs. People in the UK like dead people, which might be either tied to a fascination with more ghoulish aspects of archaeology, but, as Kulik notes, might be just an undeniable human connection that matters to the public. A fifth of the monuments category was comprised by Stonehenge, or the pyramids. Some of this is perhaps attributable to the affordances of film. Experimental archaeology, Stonehenge, and bodies all look better on camera than, say, a lot of digital archaeology, which I do, which mostly features people looking at computers. A lot. The genres that Kulik discovered were roughly collected into these six categories. Backstage, detective, essay, how-to, expository, and reconstruction. Of these, Kulik notes that it is encouraging that programs within the backstage and how-to genres persist, and one might argue that these are uniquely suited to archaeology. They take time to produce, cannot guarantee results in advance, eschew conventional narrative hooks, and are primarily concerned with demonstrating archaeological processes and producing new knowledge. These are easier to produce with lightweight cameras, as demonstrated through the popular Digging for Britain, which allows archaeologists to record their own footage. These can focus on participants' involvement and enthusiasm to sell the narrative. Relatedly, we have a student right now working on updating this study for her dissertation, incorporating online services such as Netflix. It should be interesting to see how the television landscape has changed. As is perhaps noted in the Kulik, archaeology has been on television for quite some time. In her article, Sarah Perry found archaeology in television in 1937, but this footage seems elusive. This episode of Buried Treasure features the site of Jericho, and Kathleen Kenyon and Tessa Wheeler discuss their excavations. As you watch, note the focus on dig house life, the division of the directors from the local workers, the division of labor, the slightly sketchy excavation conditions, and the casual racism. Note who is featured, who has a name, and who is anonymous. Altogether, the site is a spectacular one. But we don't think much about that. At 6.45 in the morning, when we all four gather in the mess room of the camp house, which is the headquarters of the excavation. There, the great teapot dominates the center of the table, as the 22 supervisory members of the excavation consume tea and thick marmalade sandwiches before work starts. Meanwhile, the 200 or so Arab workmen who are employed on the excavation are gathering in front of the camp house, together with the women from the refugee village who are already bringing their water jars to fill the spring. They collect their tools and baskets from the camp house, 
And then at seven o'clock, everybody troops up out of the hotel to start the day's work. There are seven main trenches on the mound, each in charge of a supervisor, a trained archaeologist. The supervisor of this particular site is Dr. Tushingham, the assistant director of the excavation, who is the director of the archaeology division of the Royal Ontario Museum, Toronto. The workers are divided into three main types, pickmen, homemen, and basket boys. Here, a homem is filling the earth into a basket. The boys who pass the baskets of earth up the steps, to the side of the cuttings, don't always work as hard as this. These pickmen, who may sometimes use a trowel and not a pick, are working under the immediate supervision of Pooh Oliver, one of the Americans in the excavation party. In another trench, some skeletons have emerged from beneath the floor of a late Stone Age house. They are being painted with preserving fluid and will be plotted and photographed before being lifted and studied by the expedition's anatomist. A child has been buried here as well, the victim perhaps of some epidemic. The supervisor of this site is Bill Parr from the University of Toronto, another of the Canadian members of the expedition. I've linked to the page that lists these episodes on the VLE. So, after 80 years of archaeology being featured on television and film, analyzed for its focus on treasure and burials, what is more recent programming like? Britain's Biggest Dig is being aired during the autumn of 2020 and features the archaeology for HS2, a railway scheme that many of our graduates are employed on. Watch for the content, representation of the presenters, the time periods represented. How would Carol Kulik classify this show? Is it different than previous representations of archaeology, or largely similar? Who are the nameless workmen in this video? Because beneath these seemingly unremarkable gardens lies a vast cemetery. And now part of Britain's biggest ever archaeological dig. I'm Yasmin Khan. The size of this place is astonishing. Hundreds of people, each doing their own individual tasks, all working to try and find out what lies beneath the soil here. And I'm Alice Roberts. That coffin is so well preserved. I wasn't expecting anything like that. Together, we're going to dig deep into the huge excavations here at St James's. part of major investigations along the 150-mile route of HS2, the new high-speed rail link between London, Birmingham and beyond. HS2 is a controversial project, but as well as building a railway, it is revealing a vast amount about our past. Archaeologists will investigate every hill and valley along the route. The law requires them to excavate and rebury any human remains and ensure that none of our precious history is lost. On the way, we'll uncover some real mysteries. The hands are missing. What's going on here? That's really peculiar. And explore the birth of the Industrial Age. I feel like I'm standing at the heart of the railway revolution. The investigations will continue along the entire train line. It's an unprecedented opportunity to look at our past in a different way. As a historian, I'm particularly fascinated by the surviving cemetery records. It says underneath, child not dead. As an anthropologist, I'm interested in the skeletons, but also in the objects buried with them. It is highly decorative. It's wonderful, look at this. In this episode, we'll uncover the forgotten stories of both rich and poor in Georgian London. We'll search for lost celebrities, from champion boxers to global explorers. And we'll discover the real-life secrets of a city that changed the world. Finally, we come to Time Team. The production of Time Team was ongoing from 1991 to 2013 and now features heavily in reruns. 
It was exported to over 36 countries and significantly shaped the way that archaeological research was perceived by the public in the UK and beyond. In Time Team, a team of archaeologists, historians, and other specialists work on three-day-long excavations of sites in Britain. A broad range of sites are investigated regarding time period and scale. In her article, Chiara Bonacci examines the impact of the series on the public. As she notes, between 1998 and 2002, audience figures for Time Team reached between 2.8 and 3.6 million viewers per episode. She used a survey to determine the profile of Time Team viewers regarding their understanding of archaeology and sociodemographic characteristics, their experience of the television show, and what specifically brought them enjoyment about the series. She found that the show encouraged people to plan visits to archaeological sites and to choose archaeological careers, and that viewers developed an informed understanding of the aims and methods of archaeology previously unheard of before the program. With all this in mind, here's a clip from a Time Team episode from 2005 featuring the amazing Nether Poppleton, a suburb of York. Watch for Tony Robinson trying to make walking through said suburb interesting to the quick cut to the helicopter and how they establish the context for their investigations. Village of Nether Poppleton just outside York. As you can see, most of the houses are modern, some are Victorian, a few are 18th or at a push 17th century. But from up here, it looks very different. Even I can recognize a traditional medieval village layout with the main street running up to the church and lots of little plots running off it. And those earthworks to the side of the church are an officially registered medieval site. But the locals think it's older. They think they can trace the roots of their village back to the Normans or even the Saxons. Are they right? We've got just three days to find out. Finally, I wanted to mention the dark side of archaeology on film in the form of Nazi war diggers. Nazi War Diggers was a documentary series about metal detectorists digging up World War II graves in Latvia. Yes, it is that bad. If you examine the slide, you see one of the hosts holding up a femur with a pretty recent looking break at the end. There was much outcry about the series amongst archaeologists, which caused it to eventually rebrand as Battlefield Recovery. While you watch the clip, note the framing of the so-called excavation, the profiles of people, none of whom are archaeologists, and the emphasis on the recovery of World War II artifacts. Also note the heavily disclaimer at the top of the episode. These disclaimers are throughout, assuring the audience that the excavations were careful and took place over several days, while the footage clearly demonstrates otherwise. In this episode of Battlefield Recovery, a buried bunker and the buried secrets of the soldiers who fought and died here. We open like a time chest. Look. The Eastern Front of World War II, where Hitler and Stalin's armies fought to the death. Millions of soldiers and their weapons lie rotting under the battlefields where they fell. Four men, determined to combine their skills and unearth this history. Craig, military tactics. I'm a historian and a military officer. That's a bunker. When other people see fields and trees, I see a battlefield. I see fighting positions. I see fields of fire. Chris, gadgets. Digging is like a science. Didn't I say the ground yeah. felt hollow? It's knowing your terrain, your target, and most of all, your kit. Did you bury a dead body right outside your door? Stephen, relics of rust. Look at the condition of that. Give me a piece of World War II scrap, and I can identify what it was, who made it, and in what year? This is the fellow we're looking for. And Adrian, the man with the Eastern Front in his blood. <laughs> that is the German uniform. I'm half British and I'm half Polish, and to me, these things are personal. I literally got goosebumps on my back. They are racing against time to save the history from the ground before it's lost forever. Let's get digging. I love days like this. Adolf Hitler was dead, and Germany's army, the Wehrmacht, was being crushed across the Eastern Front by Stalin's victorious forces. In Soldus, in western Latvia, 
the desperate men of the German 18th Army were holed up in bunkers and trenches encircled by the Soviets. Surrender, also known as capitulation, was inevitable. I really like the disclaimer. This is not archaeology. This is battlefield recovery. So what do we do when the archaeological subject becomes fascinating enough that we have interested amateurs yanking war dead out of the ground? Make our own film, of course, which will be featured after this break. <laughs>